This is the face of a man who does not know he is about to become one of the most despised individuals in the United States and even the world, but clearly does seem to know that something very bad has just happened. But before we begin to unpack the events that transpired leading up to Officer Derek Chauvin's face being etched with such a profound sense of dread, it's important to provide some disclosures about the nature of what lies ahead in this video. The footage of George Floyd's death, as seen from the perspective of bystanders, and then later from the perspective of the involved officers once their body cam videos were released, is something that many people find upsetting to put it mildly, just about anyone will find it difficult to watch. However, if you are the type of person who finds such footage difficult to watch, to the extent that it possibly impedes your mental health, you should not watch this video because the most upsetting portions of that footage will not just be played in the time to come, they will be played repeatedly. They will sometimes be rewound, slowed down, zoomed in on, and annotated, not for the purpose of exploiting a tragedy by gratuitously emphasizing its most shocking aspects, but to best give viewers the opportunity to make up their own mind as to the question of Derek Chauvin's level of legal culpability that has been debated in the media and recently decided upon by a jury of his peers. To provide further clarity about what this video is, it's worth explicitly stating what it is not. It is not a piece designed to lament the plight of black Americans at the hands of law enforcement, nor is it seeking to combat certain notions about the police and their treatment of the citizenry they are sworn to serve and protect. This video does not have an overarching political agenda of any kind, and will make no comment in regards to the broader socio-political debates that have stemmed from this case and others like it. What it does seek to do is analyze Derek Chauvin's encounter with George Floyd from the perspective of both the prosecution and the defense, using the arguments and expert testimony they presented over the course of several weeks when Derek Chauvin was on trial. The commentary that will be applied to the raw humanity of George Floyd's final moments will at times be so detached it may even come across as callous to some, and in a sense it is, but in a sense, so are trials. Formal proceedings guided by a very strict set of rules designed to give a group of everyday people the fullest and most sober understanding of the facts at hand possible for them to best determine the most appropriate charge if any in accordance with the precise wording of the laws that are pertinent to the case in front of them. Real life trials are not jam packed with the rousing speeches and dramatic back and forths you see in film and television. They are by design dry and constrained by protocol to the extent that they are frankly boring for the vast majority of the time, even when the cases they are centered around are anything but. With all of that said, let's go over the evening's events once with no argumentation to get an idea of what the state of Minnesota and Derek Chauvin have to work with. On Memorial Day of 2020, around 8 p.m., George Floyd and his friend Maurice Hall enter the Minneapolis grocery store Cup Foods on the corner of East 38th Street and Chicago Avenue. Floyd purchases a pack of cigarettes and then returns to his car with Hall and another friend, Shawanda Hill, who they run into while in the store. After Floyd has left Cup Foods, the cashier who sold Floyd the cigarettes, Christopher Martin, determines the $20 bill he used to be counterfeit and subsequently walks across the street, accompanied by a co-worker, to where Floyd is parked in his car. They approach the passenger side where Hall is seated and inform the occupants that they need Floyd to return to the store and either pay with a different note or return the cigarettes. Martin observed Floyd to be in some kind of distress. Ultimately, Hall informs them that they will be refusing to return to Cup Foods. Martin and his co-worker go back to the store, where their manager instructs them to again speak with the occupants of the car to try to convince them to return. Martin does so, accompanied this time by two different co-workers, one of whom approaches the driver's side of the car occupied by Floyd, and then after a brief moment the passenger side occupied by Hall. Hall argues with the store employees, and during the exchange, rips a counterfeit bill he had tried to use in the store earlier in half and drops it on the ground. 
Martin again observed Floyd to be exhibiting signs of distress, but he was not verbalizing much of anything that Martin would be able to later recall. The Cup Foods employees again returned to the store with the occupants of the car refusing to accompany them. Shortly thereafter, one of the employees calls the police. Officers Alexander King and Thomas Lane respond to the call and enter the store at about 8.08pm. The manager points them to Floyd's car, which they proceed toward, with Officer Lane approaching the driver's side occupied by Floyd. Stay in the car. Let me see your other hand. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me see your other hand. Please, Both hands. Do nothing. Put your fucking hands up right now. Let me see your other hand. What do we do? Put your hand up there. Put your fucking hand up there. Jesus Christ. Keep your fucking hands on the wheel. Keep your fucking hands on the wheel. I'm sorry, Mr. Who else is in the car? Put your foot back in. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. God dang, man. Man, I got, I got shot the same way, Mr. Officer, before. Okay, well, when I say let me I'm see sorry. your hands, you put your fucking oh, hands up. Man, I'm so sorry, Mr. Officer. You got them? Man, dang, man. Put your hands on top of your head. Man, Mr. Officer. Last time I got shot like that, Mr. Officer. Hands on top of your head. Hands on top of your head. Step out of the vehicle and step away from me, all right? Step out and face away. <laughs> Step like, out and face away. Okay, Mr. Officer, please don't shoot me. Please, man. I'm not going to shoot please. you. Step out and face no, away. I'm going to get you out of here, man. Please don't shoot me, man. I'm not shooting you, man. Please, man. I just lost my mom, please, man. Please, man. Step out and face away. <laughs> please, please, man. Please, please. I didn't know, man. Get out of the car. I didn't know, Mr. Officer. I didn't know. In the yes, car. Sir. Yes, sir. Stop moving. Stop. Put your hands behind your back then. I'm not going to do nothing. Floyd continues to weep and plead with officers Lane and King, who cuff his hands behind his back, which Floyd offers some physical resistance to. I ain't going to do that that's wrong, man. Come on, walk with me. Like walk with me. Thinking. Walk with me. Come on, man. God damn, man. Stand up. Why are you doing me like this? Stand man? up. God damn, Come on. Man. I just want to stop through. We're trying to get out of the street here so you don't get hit by a car. That's it, man. Officer Lane walks over to Holland Hill, instructing them to stay where they are and attempts to get an explanation as to why Floyd is in such an emotionally volatile state, while King has Floyd sit on the sidewalk nearby. Yes, sir, I will. <laughs> hey, man. Please, please, man. You got an ID on you? <laughs> I got one at home. <laughs> All right, what's your name? George. George? George Perry Floyd. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Man, that's it. Spell it for me. G-E-O. <laughs> yep. R-G-E. Last name? Floyd. F-L-O-Y-D. F-L-O-Y-D? Yes. While Floyd remains clearly upset, his behavior becomes more subdued for a time as he converses with the officers. God, you got man. foam around your mouth too? Yes. Yes, I was just moving earlier. Okay. Man, what up? All right, let me calm down now. This is a little better now. Well, right. Okay, let's stop. Give me one favor, man. And we're going to talk about that once we get to the car. Floyd begins heavily resisting arrest once officers Lane and King bring him to their squad car with the intent of putting him in the back. Hey. Ah. Stand up, stop falling down. I'm claustrophobic, man. Stand up. I'm claustrophobic. Stay on your feet and face the car door. Man. Officers Lane and King search Floyd, finding a glass pipe on him. Uh, Take a okay, seat. Okay, 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 okay. Why okay. are you having trouble because walking? Because, because my, my hands are hurting. Down, we will okay. please, man. Please don't do this. Take a seat. I'm going in. I'm going no, in. you're not. I gotta go in. Take a seat. Grab a seat, man. Why I don't believe me, Mr. Officer? Take a seat. I'm not the kind of guy. I'm not that kind of guy, man. Take a seat. No, I'm a die Take a seat. I'm a die, man. You need to take a seat you right know, now. And I just had COVID, man. I don't want to go back to that. Take okay, a seat. I'll roll the windows no. down. Hey, listen. Dang, man. Listen. I'm not that kind of guy. I'll roll the windows down Please, as you man. put your legs in, all right? I'll put the air on. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Not even look, listening. Look at it. Look at it. We can fix look. it, but not while you're standing out okay, here. Okay, man. God, y'all do me bad, man. Man, I don't, I don't want to try to win. I don't want to try to win. The man you can now hear in the background is Charles McMillan. The 61-year-old pulled over his car a few minutes earlier upon witnessing the beginnings of Floyd's interaction with the police and wanting to investigate further, being nosy, as he will later put it. 
Macmillan will continually plead with Floyd to cooperate with the officers and get in the back of the squad car. I don't want to win. I, I'm claustrophobic. You ain't going to win. I'm claustrophobic. I got anxiety. I don't want to do nothing to I'll roll the window down. Man, I'm scared as fuck, man. Officers Derek Chauvin and Tu Tao have now arrived on scene and can be seen approaching the squad car here. Officer Chauvin assists Officer King in controlling Floyd on the sidewalk facing side of the patrol car while Officer Lane heads over to the other side to attempt to pull him in from the back and Officer Tao monitors the situation. Get in the car! Get me in the front! Please. No, you're not getting in the front! I've got the movie, so I was in the car! Okay, man, okay! I'm not a bad guy, man! Get in the car! I'm not a bad guy! Ah! Oh, God! Ah! Oh, man! Ah, what's my double? Please, officer! Please! Sit! Please! Take a seat! Ah! Babe! Please! No, I don't have to take a seat! I can't! I can't joke! I can't! I'm gonna lay on the ground! 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 Ah! I can't fucking breathe. Here, come on out. Look at you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah! Yeah, just when you get up. The officers continue to appear to have a hard time restraining Floyd, and at 2019-15, we can for the first time see a glimpse of Derek Chauvin placing his knee on George Floyd's neck area. <laughs> and more clearly here at 2019-19. You got your uh, <laughs> Thank you. Stop moving. Mama. 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 One of the front pouches. Mama. On my right side back. Mama. Mama. The three officers will continue to hold Floyd in place, face down, in what will be from here on referred to as the prone position, while Floyd continues to yell and state multiple times that he can't breathe. Alright. Hopefully Park's still sitting on the car there. It is at about this time that 17-year-old Donella Frazier begins filming the scene with her smartphone. She will later post the video from her perspective on Facebook, and it will subsequently go viral and spark worldwide protests. Please, man. Please, man. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, you got him down, man. Let him breathe, least, man. I can't breathe. I've been trying to hear about it. So you can breathe with him. 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 Breathe with Breathe Please, the knee my dick. I can't breathe shit. Uh -huh. Bro, get up, get in the car, man. I will. Get up, get in the car. I can't move. Get up, get in the car. Mama. Mama. I can't. Get in, get in, get in. Is that the shaking of the eyes, right? As we see people. My knee. My neck. I'm through. I'm through. Really I'm through. Uh, I'm claustrophobic. The officers continue to hold Floyd in place as they wait for EMS to arrive on scene. As they do, more people gather on the sidewalk and begin to voice their concerns about the officers' actions and the state of Floyd's health as time goes on. Back off! He's not responsive right now! He's not responsive right now! He's not responsive right now! He's not responsive right now, bro! No, bro, look at him! He's not responsive right now, bro! Bro, are you serious? Is he breathing right now? Check his pulse. Check his pulse. Check his pulse. What you think that is? You saw you call what he did. You call what he did. Emergency medical services arrive, and at 42 seconds past 8:26 p.m., Officer Chauvin ceases applying pressure to Floyd's body. 
Floyd is then placed onto a gurney and into an ambulance that leaves the scene while medics inside, assisted for a time by Officer Lane, try unsuccessfully to resuscitate him. George Floyd was pronounced dead at 9.25pm at the Hennepin County Medical Center. The next day, after video of the event, most notably the phone footage captured by Frazier, began making the rounds on the internet, officers King, Lane, Tao and Chauvin were fired. On May 29th, Derek Chauvin was arrested on charges of third degree murder and second degree manslaughter, and then later the higher charge of second degree murder. King, Lane and Tao were also charged with aiding and abetting Chauvin, but their trials will not take place until later this year and the arguments for their culpability or lack thereof will not be examined in this video. Derek Chauvin's trial commenced in March of 2021. At the time that you are watching this video, the jury have returned their verdict, but for most of the time it was being written and produced, they had not, and it is from that perspective that the case will be looked at worded in the present tense, with Derek Chauvin's fate still up in the air. First let's take a look at the three charges, and exactly what they mean from the perspective of a jury being instructed to consider and deliberate them. Under Minnesota law, a person can be convicted of murder in the second degree, even if they had no intent to kill their victim, if said victim is killed during the commission of a felony. The felony in this case is third degree assault, Third degree assault in Minnesota is defined, among other things, as an assault that results in substantial bodily harm. The bottom line is that the state does not have to prove any intent on Derek Chauvin's part to kill George Floyd. If they can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Derek Chauvin intentionally perpetrated a third degree assault on George Floyd, and in the course of perpetrating that assault, caused George Floyd's death, then he is guilty of murder in the second degree. Minnesota defines murder in the third degree as a person who quote without intent to affect the death of any person causes the death of another by perpetrating an act eminently dangerous to others and evincing a depraved mind without regard for human life. If you find that wording confusing in terms of how it relates to the circumstances of this case, you're not alone. Earlier in the proceedings, in October of 2020, Judge Peter Cahill ruled the charge could quote, be sustained only in situations in which the defendant's actions were imminently dangerous to other persons, and were not specifically directed at the particular person whose death occurred. Consequently, Judge Cahill dropped the charge, as Chauvin's actions were specifically directed at Floyd. Funnily enough, this is also the charge that Chauvin tried and failed to get a plea bargain on. But let's not get too deep into the weeds. Long story short, Judge Cahill was eventually made to reconsider his decision by the Minnesota Court of Appeals, and he ultimately put the third degree murder charge back on the table. The jury were instructed to consider the charge in the following terms. A person commits an act imminently dangerous to others when the act is highly likely to cause death. So if the prosecution can demonstrate beyond a reasonable doubt that Derek Chauvin committed an act that demonstrated a conscious indifference to the loss of life, and that act caused George Floyd's death, then he is guilty of murder in the third degree. Then for the third, final, and least severe charge, Chauvin faces manslaughter in the second degree. This is the most straightforward of the three charges. Second degree manslaughter in Minnesota is defined among other things as a person who causes the death of another by culpable negligence, whereby the person creates an unreasonable risk and consciously takes chances of causing death or great bodily harm. If the prosecution can demonstrate beyond a reasonable doubt that Derek Chauvin committed an act that an ordinary and reasonably prudent person would recognize as involving a strong probability of resulting in death or great bodily harm, and that act caused George Floyd's death, then he is guilty of manslaughter in the second degree. The key people who will be taking on the task of proving the most severe interpretation of Chauvin's actions beyond a reasonable doubt are Assistant Attorney General Michael Frank and Assistant Attorney General Erin Eldridge. The state have also brought in some outside help from Special Assistant Attorney General Jerry Blackwell, founding partner, CEO and chairman of trial firm Blackwell Burke and a founder of the Minnesota Association of Black Lawyers. Blackwell is known to be especially gifted at communicating complicated legal and medical concepts in an understandable manner to jurors. 
and finally Special Assistant Attorney General Steve Slisher. A partner at the Minneapolis law firm Melson LLP, Slisher served as a federal prosecutor for 13 years before joining Melson. The prosecution team is further aided by 10 other lawyers working behind the scenes. In Derek Chauvin's corner, we have Eric Nelson and Amy Voss. Though Voss is a licensed attorney, you won't be hearing from her as she is serving as Nelson's assistant in this case. Eric Nelson is a founding partner and attorney at Hellberg Criminal Defense, the largest criminal defense firm in Minnesota according to their website. He is also one of 12 lawyers on the roster of the Minnesota Police and Peace Officer Association's Legal Defense Fund, who represent Minnesota police officers that run into trouble with the law while in the line of duty. Nelson does have additional help in the form of being able to confer with the other 11 lawyers from the MPPOA, as well as specialist consultants that work with the organization. So he isn't quite as alone as he appears, but the gap between the prosecution and defense's resources in this case is still inarguably immense. Between that gap in resources and the guidelines of the charges that we've been through, it will likely be clear to you that the defense really has their work cut out for them. Remember, none of the three counts that Chauvin is facing can be combated with the argument that he was responsible for George Floyd's death, but it was a tragic accident. All the prosecution needs to convince the jury of is that his actions were deliberate and that they were a substantial causal factor in George Floyd's death. If they can get that much across the line, then Chauvin is toast. So what does the defense have at their disposal to push back on the state's case? Their first and biggest potential out is encapsulated in another jury instruction. The defendant is not guilty if he used force that is authorized by law. All of the language relating to Chauvin intentionally inflicting substantial bodily harm that caused Floyd's death is negated if those actions were within the purview of Chauvin's authority as a police officer under Minnesota Police's rules and guidelines. Because this is Chauvin's clearest line of defense, it is also the one that the prosecution will predictably attack the most vigorously. Officer, as you look at Exhibit 17, is this a trained technique that's uh, by the Minneapolis Police Department when you were uh, overseeing the training unit? It is not. Okay, why not? Uh, well, use of force according to policy has to be, you know, consistent with MPD training, and what we train our neck restraints, the conscious and unconscious neck restraint. So per policy, uh, a neck restraint is compressing one or both sides of the neck using an arm or leg, but what we train is using uh, one arm or two arm to do a, a neck restraint. And how does this differ? I don't know what kind of improvised position that is. So that's not what we train. At this time, I'd like to republish Exhibit 17. Sir, is this an MPD-trained neck restraint? No, sir. Has it ever been? Not to my neck restraint? No, sir. <clears throat> is this an MPD-authorized uh, restraint technique? A uh, knee on the neck would be something that uh, does happen in use of force that isn't unauthorized. And under what circumstances would that be authorized? How long can you do that? I don't know if there's a time frame. It would depend on the circumstance of the time. Okay. Which would include what? <clears throat> the type of resistance you're getting from the subject that you're putting the knee on. Right. And so if there was, uh, say for example, uh, the subject was under control and handcuffed, would this be authorized? I would say no. Have you ever, in all the years you've been working for the Minneapolis Police Department, uh, been trained to kneel on the neck of someone who is handcuffed behind their back in a prone position? No, I haven't. Is that, if that were done, would that be considered force? Absolutely. What level of force might that be? That would be the top tier, the deadly force. Why? Because of uh, the fact that um, if, if your knee is on a person's neck, that can kill them. Based on your review of the body-worn camera footage, uh, do you have an opinion as to when the restraint of Mr. Floyd should have ended in this encounter? Yes. What is it? When Mr. Floyd was no longer offering up any resistance to the officers, they could have ended the restraint. And that was after he was handcuffed and on the ground and no longer resistant? Correct. 
as you reflect on Exhibit 17, I must ask you, is this a trained Minneapolis Police Department defensive tactics technique? It is not. Well, we read the uh, departmental policy on neck restraints. Is this a neck restraint? Um, the conscious neck restraint by policy mentions light to moderate pressure. When I look at Exhibit 17, um, and when I look at the facial expression of, of, of Mr. Floyd, that does not appear in any way, shape, or form that that is light to moderate pressure. So is it your belief then that this particular form of restraint, if that's what you, if that's what we'll call it, uh, in fact violates departmental policy? I absolutely agree that violates our policy. I ask you if the defendant, uh, if you observe the defendant on a body-worn camera apply any other type of force upon George Floyd other than what you saw with respect to his legs and body weight? Uh, yes, um, towards the beginning of the original restraint, um, Mr. Correction, the defendant was, used his right hand and he was attempting, appeared to be attempting to use a pain compliance on Mr. Floyd's left hand. Using Exhibit 255, sir, can you please uh, explain to the jury what you mean and if the, if the stylus would help, you can use that. Here, you can see the defendant's right hand grasping the fingers of Mr. Floyd's left hand. It appears to be squeezing him. Okay. And you use that term pain compliance. Can you please describe what that means? Yes, so pain compliance is a technique that officers use to get a subject to comply with their commands. Uh, as they comply, then they are rewarded with the reduction of pain. And how would this positioning uh, induce pain? This can induce pain a couple of ways, either by squeezing of the fingers and uh, bringing the knuckles together, which can cause pain, or also uh, basically pulling the wrist into the handcuff, which can cause pain as well. And you can see on exhibit 255 where there's a, a where Mr. Floyd is handcuffed? Yes. Can you please uh, put a circle around that? All right, so is it your testimony then that the drawing of the fingers down and the wrist down towards the handcuffs could induce pain? Yes, especially because the handcuffs were not double locked. Um, double locked meaning that they were not they could continue to ratchet tighter as uh, the person moved. Were you able to hear instances of what you recognize to be ratcheting during the, your review of the body-worn cameras? Yes. Right. So in the principle of pain compliance, if I'm to understand your testimony, you would inflict pain for the purpose of uh, having the subject uh, obey your command? Yes, comply. What if there's no opportunity for compliance? Uh, then at that point, it's just pain. Sir, could you uh, read into the record for the jury what the definition of deadly force is, beginning at force which the actor uses? Yes. Force which the actor uses with the purpose of causing or which the actor should reasonably know creates a substantial risk of causing death of great bodily harm. And I'm going to ask you, sir, do you have an opinion to a degree of reasonable professional certainty whether the force used, as shown in Exhibit 254, uh, whether that force uh, being applied then for the restraint period, which you've defined as 9 minutes and 29 seconds, would constitute deadly force? Yes. And what is that opinion? That it would. Why is that? Because at the time of the restraint period, Mr. Floyd was not resisting. He was in, in the prone position. Um, he, he was handcuffed. He was not uh, attempting to uh, evade. He was not attempting to resist and the pressure um, that he was, that was being caused by the body weight uh, would, uh, could cause positional asphyxia, which could cause death. Is positional asphyxia a, a known risk in law enforcement? Yes, it is. How long have the dangers of positional asphyxia been known? At least 20 years. I, I can recall a uh, Department of Justice memo from I believe 1995 that discussed it and I know that I was trained on it in uh, 1995 as well.
Of course, the defence gets to cross-examine all these witnesses, and Eric Nelson's cross of Sergeant Steiger gives a good insight into their counter-arguments to the notion that Chauvin's actions were categorically against his training, as well as providing a preview of their other lines of defence that will be coming later. When we look at the use of force, we don't look at the use of force in a vacuum, do we? No, we do not. We should not. Some, I've seen some agencies, that's all they focus on is the actual use of force. But when I do my analysis, I look at the totality of the circumstances, meaning I look at the officer's tactics, um, as well as uh, the subject's actions during the whole entire incident. Right. And because it's a totality of the circumstances analysis, we need to, and it's objectively reasonable based on the facts of this particular case, correct? Correct. And so we need to look very closely at all of the facts in, de in assessing whether or not the use of force was reasonable. Agreed? Agreed. So let's talk about the facts of this case. Do you understand that Officer Chauvin was the initial officer dispatched to this call? Uh, yes. And that, that dispatch ultimately the, what's called the sector car, took over the call and Officer Chauvin was no longer uh, responding, right? Correct. He was no longer the primary unit. Right. It's reasonable for a police officer to rely upon information he, re he or she receives from dispatch, correct? Correct. And so you understand that in this particular case, dispatch advised the officers that the suspect was still on scene, correct? Correct. That it was a priority one response call, correct? Correct. That means get there quick, right? That's code three, get there with lights and sirens, right? I, I don't know the exact code for Minneapolis PD, but I, I, believe, I believe you. One thing you need to understand when watching attorneys question witnesses is that they are under a very strict set of rules that while do serve a purpose, also contribute to how laborious trial proceedings are to watch. Nelson isn't allowed to just walk up and start arguing with a prosecution witness, for instance, and witnesses themselves are instructed to keep their answers within the parameters of the questions they're being asked. An attorney's job, then, is to ask a series of questions that they feel, if answered properly and truthfully, will serve the case they're trying to make. So while Nelson's line of questioning over the past couple of minutes may seem tedious, he's actually doing a perfectly good job. Chauvin's defense is that because he was unable to see the future, or know precisely what George Floyd was capable of, he was justified in using the force he did as a precautionary measure, given the information he did have at hand in the moment, such as the fact that he was dispatched on a priority one response call, indicating the suspect was likely more dangerous than if he were called in on something non-urgent. Unable to make that argument directly, Nelson is small-stepping Sergeant Steiger toward making it for him with questions he has to give an affirmative response to. And when he arrived, he observed Mr. Floyd and two officers, correct? Correct. At the back seat of a squad car, correct? Correct. And what you described as Mr. Floyd actively resisting their attempts to put him into the back seat of the squad car. Yes. At that point, According to the model, the use of force continuum, Officer Chauvin, theoretically, based on what he saw, active resistance, he could have come up and dry stunned him or tased him. That would be within the active resistance, struggling use of force continuum. Yes. He didn't do that, right? No, he did not. Have you ever had a person feign a physical ailment as you attempted to arrest them? Yes. Right. Sometimes people will say, I'm having a heart attack, right? I think I'm having a heart attack, don't take me to jail. Take me to the hospital. Yes. It's fair to say that one of the things that an officer has to do in the assessment of the reasonableness of his use of force is take into consideration what the suspect is saying and how he's acting. Yes, 100%. Right. So if somebody is saying, I can't breathe and they're passing out and they're not resisting, that's one form of an analysis, right? Yes. Because the actions of the suspect are consistent with the verbal uh, utterances he's making, right? Yes. Other times, and in this particular case, when Mr. Floyd was initially saying that he couldn't breathe, he was actively resisting arrest. Initially when he was in the backseat of the vehicle, yes. I can't choke! 
I can't breathe, Bobby. Please. Please. You're talking. Ah. Sit down. Ah. Ah. Fine. Ah. Now, you have testified, as I understand your testimony, that once that the officers putting Mr. Floyd into the prone position was initially a reasonable use of force, right? Yes. And you're familiar with the swarm technique? Yes. Where multiple officers are on top of a resisting sus suspect trying to control the extremities, right? Yes, typically that's done prior to handcuffing. Right. But that's, once you're putting someone into, once someone is handcuffed, right, and they're in the ground, a person who's in handcuffs can continue to be a threat. Agreed? Yes. They can kick you. Correct. Right? They could bite you. Correct. They could thrash and get free and start running, right? In certain instances, yes. Right. And in certain instances, uh, they can even get your weapon, right? Yes. They could get your gun from you, even though they're handcuffed. Yes. So the notion that an, a, a handcuffed suspect no longer presents a threat to an officer is not correct. It depends on the circumstances. Right. A, a handcuffed suspect can continue to present a risk. Based on that person's actions, yes. Right. And so once you uh, have a suspect in the prone position and they continue to kick, it may require more force than if they were compliant, right? Yes. Do you participate in a uh, training or present a training or have anything to do with a training called awful but lawful or lawful but awful, something like that? Yes. And so you would agree the general concept is sometimes the use of force, it looks really bad, right? Yes. And sometimes it may be so, it may be caught on video, right? And yes. it looks bad, right? Yes. But it's still lawful. Yes, based on the, that department's policies or based on that state's law. You've heard the, the, the phrase, control the head, control the body? Yes. And that's commonly what police officers are trained, right? Yes, when it comes to handcuffing, correct. And in ground defense, right? Yes. And in the context of ground defense or in handcuffing or continuing to restrain a police or a suspect, control the head, control the body, right? Yes, when they are resisting. And you see here, this officer's knee appears to be over the neck and head of the subject as he's attempting to handcuff him, correct? Correct. And so there are circumstances when the, hand, the knee is put in this position, correct? Yes, but officers are always cautioned to uh, try to stay away from the neck as much as possible. All right. Sir, you were shown some training materials uh, that included photographs of officers in positions in which they would have their legs on the uh, subject's back uh, and the base of the neck. Is that right? Yes. And in the photograph, you were shown that subject uh, was not yet handcuffed, was he? No, he was not. And, and the purpose of situating oneself on a subject is to gain control in order to handcuff the individual. Yes. And what is the officer supposed to do after they handcuff the individual? Immediately sit the person up or put him in a side recovery position. You were asked to comment on uh, sort of the notion that some things that law enforcement do, or have to do, uses of force, are not attractive to the public. Is that right? Correct. A moment ago, we talked about how attorneys need to structure questions in a way that do not in and of themselves form an argument, but are of course designed to elicit an answer that serves their case. Steve Slisher is particularly artful at this. And, and in fact, you were asked uh, about a presentation that you had given relative to that called, was it uh, awful but lawful? Yes. And. To be lawful, the force must be objectively reasonable, correct? Correct. And if, there, and if it isn't lawful, then what's left? Um, <laughs> well, the, the whole premise of the presentation was that in certain situations, uh, based on a policy or a particular law, uh, 
even though the situation uh, may be deemed lawful in the community's eyes, in the, the use of force is awful. So it was stating that, hey, in these situations, you can have a situation where by law it looks uh, horrible to the common eye, but based on the state law, it, it, it's lawful. But if it's not objectively reasonable and it's not lawful, then it's just awful. Correct. Right. Nothing further. On the topic of use of force, both the prosecution and the defense brought in expert witnesses that focused their entire careers on this narrow area. Can you uh, tell me the number of times that you've testified in either civil or criminal cases? I've testified in court, either criminal or civil, both state and federal, 10 times. Uh, what what is your fee your hourly rate uh, $295 an hour in this case I make $350 an hour for courtroom appearances and $275 an hour for case reviews in your career have you ever uh, been retained by someone and found their use of force to be improper on several times why is that my review of the facts did not favor them so my my Credibility is very important to me, and if I am retained and develop an opinion that does not favor the attorney who retains me, um, that's still my opinion. There's no reason to think that either use of force experts Seth Stoughton or Barry Broad are hired guns that will render any opinion a client wants so long as the price is right. Whenever the state or a defense attorney hire an outside expert, there is indeed a chance that person may render an opinion that doesn't favor their case. There is no chance, however, that person will subsequently be put on the stand. We'll start with the prosecution's expert, Seth Stoughton, before taking a closer look at the most crucial section of the body cam footage. You're aware that the, uh, the officers attempted to place him in the back of the vehicle and he was eventually um, taken back out of the back of the vehicle and into the street, is that right? Uh, yes, there was some non-compliance initially and then uh, what we would describe as uh, that active resistance, what appears to be physical engagement of the muscles in a non-assaultive or non-aggressive way, uh, leading ultimately to the officer's decision to take him out of the rear passenger side of the vehicle. And so in your view, a reasonable officer would not have perceived this as active resistance as an act of violence or active aggression, I should say. That's correct. This does not appear to be active aggression in the sense that uh, Mr. Floyd does not appear to have the intention to assault or attack the officers here. His efforts um, appeared aimed at not being in the backseat of the car. What? Please, man. I can't fucking breathe. Hey, come on out. Look at you. Thank you. Thank you. Get up the ground. All right. So uh, we're paused here at mark uh, 20, 08. Is that right? Yes. Now, at this point, can you please uh, describe what would have been apparent to a reasonable officer at the scene? So, um, as you heard, Mr. Floyd uh, has already said, uh, I can't breathe. And as officers pull him out of the back seat of the car, again, that point of contention from earlier, uh, you hear Mr. Floyd say, uh, thank you. And he is also uh, appears to be handcuffed, is that right? He is. He is handcuffed, and um, I believe, although not entirely clear from this freeze frame, I, I believe the, the video will show that he's on his knees at this point. Uh, at the time he was placed on his knees, I believe you indicated that he said, I appreciate that or thank you, something to that effect? Yes. All right. Uh, at that point, was it necessary for the officers to uh, prone him? No. Why no, not? Why not? Again, looking at the threat analysis here, um, it's clear from the number of officers and Mr. Floyd's position, the fact that he's handcuffed and has been searched, he doesn't present a threat of harm. His actions don't indicate that he presents any threat of escape. And as he's, uh, as he's saying thank you for being taken out of the backseat of the car, it would certainly suggest that the point of conflict that had provoked his resistance in the first place is, is over and suggests a lack of intention. On the spectrum of opinions given at this trial, Stoughton's lies at the most damning end as far as Chauvin's use of force is concerned. It goes without saying that anyone the prosecution puts on will be of the mind that the totality of his actions justify a conviction. 
but they don't necessarily concur on where his wrongdoings begin. Probably the most repeated mantra for the state is 9 minutes and 29 seconds, the total amount of time that Derek Chauvin's knee was placed on or around George Floyd's neck. But it might not be the most important count. This isn't to say they made a bad decision in emphasizing it. The longer the duration of time, the worse Chauvin looks. It's not complicated. But in the course of trying their case, they will sometimes hedge on it a little. The reason for that is that while they probably do believe they have a good case that Chauvin was using excessive force for the entirety of that 9 minutes and 29 seconds, they will also be aware that some on the jury may not ultimately wind up seeing it that way, no matter who they put on the stand to affirm their position. They're confident, however, that if that does wind up being the case, there are other markers over the course of that 9 minutes and 29 seconds that will be much more challenging to view Chauvin's decision to keep his knee on Floyd in a sympathetic light. To illustrate that, let's revisit the relevant part of the body cam footage, and you can decide where the clock most likely to convict Derek Chauvin of second degree murder begins. You were warned at the beginning of this video that it would be a very difficult watch. This is where that really starts to come to fruition. So take a moment to decide if you really want to sit through this. The time shown at the bottom left is where the breakdown ends. Take note of it for if you decide you want to skip ahead part way through. Leave, man! I can't fucking breathe! Here, come on out! Look at you, thank you, thank you. As you've just heard, it's Stoughton's opinion that Floyd expressing his thanks was a clear cue for de-escalation. The defense's position is that words are less important than actions, and as Floyd is still resisting arrest, by virtue of refusing to be put in the back of the car, force is justified. And you've already heard Sergeant Jody Steiger, himself a prosecution witness, testify the officers were justified in taking Floyd to the ground. Floyd also starts yelling again immediately after the thank you, though it's difficult to tell if it's a proactive action on his part or in response to force. It looks as if Chauvin may be pulling down on his hands, causing a ratcheting of the handcuffs during this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Get the girl. Ah! Get the girl. Ah! Yeah, on the ah! ground. Ah! On the ground. Ah, my <laughs> Stoughton believes what you just saw was Officer Lane pulling Floyd's leg. Barry Broad believes it is a kick. Watch it again a few times and see what you think. Right. You got your arm. Uh, oh. Ah. Uh, restraint. Okay, I'll grab that. Oh, we get him. Oh, Jesus Christ. I can't I can't Thank you. Floyd is now on the ground, prone, cuffed, and with the body weight of officers Chauvin, King, and Lane applied to him. Because he is continuing to yell and move, the defense contend they are justified in believing Floyd would likely become more aggressive if they were to reduce their level of restraint at this point, especially in light of how aggressive his resistance was when they were trying to get him in the car. Oh my god. I can't believe this. I can't believe this. I can't believe this. I can't believe this, man. Mama, I love you. Reese, I love you. You got hobble? Get my keys, I love you. I'm dead. Mine's in my side, it's listed, it's labeled. Uh, it says uh, it's in the I can't top. breathe for nothing, man. It's cold blooded, man. Ah, ah, hey, you're doing a lot of ah, talking, ah. The idea that if you can talk, you can breathe is something that officers Chauvin and Tao express multiple times during the video. It is a notion that is technically true, but as pulmonologist and expert medical witness for the prosecution, Dr. Martin Tobin will put it, dangerously misleading. A person's respiratory functions can be greatly impeded while they still have the ability to speak. <laughs> Mama, I love you. I can't do nothing. The yeah, EMS is on their way. My face is gone. Well, do you want to hop uh, 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 um, I can't breathe, man. Please. Right. Please let me stay in. No. Please, yeah. man. I can't breathe. Can you get up on the sidewalk, please? One side of the other, please. Ah, my face getting bad. Here, should we get his legs up? Oh my God! Nope, just, just, just leave him. Just leave him. Yep, just leave him. Ah. All right. I'm dead. Hopefully, Park's still sitting on the car. Oh. There. 
Look at my face, man. I've always found a pipe. I hate you to do this real. Please. Please. Please, I can't breathe. Please, man. Please, I'm out here. Oh, uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. oh, 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 my body just died to see. Uh, Relax. Man, I can't breathe my face. Just get up. Oh. Oh. What, what do you want? I can't breathe. Please, the knee in my dick. I can't breathe shit. Uh -huh. Get up, get in the car, man. I will. Get up, get in the car. I can't move. I've been the, whole ah. the prosecution argues that Floyd verbalizing he was willing to get into the car should have been an obvious cue for the officers to give him an opportunity to cooperate. Mama! Mama! I can't! Is that the shaking of the eyes, right? My knee! My neck! I'm through! I'm through! I'm through! I'm through! I'm My stomach hurts! My neck hurts! Everything hurts! There's water or something! Please! Please! I can't breathe, officer. Hey, don't ah. talk to him. Bobby, yell at him. They will kill me. They will kill me, man. Yeah. Ah. Takes a heck of a lot of oxygen, though. Come on, man. Yeah, that's it. That's wrong. Ah. Right there, right there. Oh. 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 Hey, you got your feet right on oh. yeah, I cannot you know. breathe. Yeah. I cannot breathe. Ah. 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 Over the past minute, the crowd that has been gathering around the scene has been growing more and more concerned, and it's around this time that some in the group begin directing insults at Chauvin. The man you can hear sarcastically calling Chauvin a tough guy is Donald Williams, and he will become particularly vocal as time goes on. The defense submit the crowd's verbal hostility as a sort of mitigating factor for Chauvin's actions, arguing that it could have caused him reasonable concern that the situation could escalate, taking some of his attention off of the state of Floyd. The prosecution argued that because the crowd's hostile words were often making reference to Floyd's state, which you'll hear for yourself very soon, their actions do not only fail to provide Chauvin with any excuse, but actually heighten his level of responsibility. Yeah. Hey, don't kill me. Hey, don't kill me. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Floyd's voice begins becoming thicker and his vocalizations further apart. The force of his movements will decrease as well. When Officer Lane, who is on his first day on duty, mentions putting Floyd on his side, he is clearly referring to the recovery position that officers are trained in. The prosecution point to this exchange as just one more example of why it is not reasonable to entertain the notion that Chauvin may have not been sufficiently educated on the risks of positional asphyxia for an individual being laid out in the prone position for an extended period of time. I just worry about the or whatever. Well, that's fine, really, I'm okay. That's awesome. Here Lane is expressing concerns for Floyd's health, not specifically that he is at risk of being asphyxiated, but instead citing excited delirium. Excited delirium is a very controversial concept, not recognized by most medical professionals, but many police officers may be trained in it, and taught that it can sometimes result in sudden death, 
Chauvin is again dismissing concerns, this time on the basis that EMS have been called. The defence contends that he is in the right, that by requesting EMS in response to Floyd's facial injuries, Chauvin was following protocol pertinent to his duty of care. Because there was a fire station very nearby, he had very good reason to believe medics would be on scene within a few minutes, and that the chances of Floyd sustaining grave injury from being held in place during that window were negligible. It's hard to talk on your bro. Get him off the ground. You're being a bum right now. You can get him off the ground, bro. You can get him off the ground. You're being a bum right now. We're here. We're here. This is the last time that George Floyd will voice a complete word. It's at this time that we'll begin our first count for how long Chauvin continues to stay on top of Floyd. What you just witnessed was an anoxic seizure, according to Dr. Martin Tobin. Anoxic seizures result from a lack of oxygen supply to the brain, and a common symptom is involuntary movement, in this case Floyd's right leg abruptly moving upward. It appears the officers have mistook it for resistance. Body language is crazy, you fucking bum. What? Yeah, I already know that, bro. I trained with half of these bum ass dudes at the academy, bro. You know that's bogus right now, bro. You know it's bogus. You can't look at me like a man because you're a bum, bro. He's not even resisting arrest right now, bro. Yeah, I think he's a bum. He's breathing right now, bro. You think that's cool? You think that's cool though, right? It is at this point that Floyd's upper body tenses, in a way that could be mistaken as resistance, for the last time. It is here that we will begin a second count. Good so far. My knee might be a little scratched, but I'll survive. Cool, though, bro. You're a bum, bro. You're, you're a bum for that. You're a bum for that, bro. You get mad. You see there. Stop when he's breathing right now. He's about to go out right now, bro. He's breathing. Bro. <laughs> bro. Yeah, he's he's going to choke him like that? What the fuck? Hey, I know what you want to do. I'm not scared of you, bro. You're fucking pussy ass dude, bro. Don't come over here. I'm scared Don't come over here. I'm up, I'm up on the sidewalk. You, yeah, we need, yeah, you, we need you to keep some distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back yeah, up. He's not. Back up. He's not. This is Genevieve Hansen. She has approached the officers, informed them that she is an off-duty Minneapolis firefighter, and has asked them if Floyd has a pulse. The prosecution point to her intervention as another point that should have brought Chauvin's attention to Floyd's condition, as well as an opportunity to provide him with medical attention in advance of the arrival of EMTs. The defense argue that her approaching the car actually served to distract Chauvin further, and that as she was not in uniform, he was not in a position to know if she was telling the truth about her credentials. They also point to the fact that she at one point called one of the officers a bitch as further reason for them to have been dubious she would have been of genuine assistance. It should be noted, however, that that did not happen until Floyd was in the ambulance. No, bro, look at him. He's not responsive right now, bro. Bro, are you serious? He's not just right here with that on his neck, bro. Is he breathing right now? Check his pulse. Check his pulse. Check his pulse, Kyle. Check his pulse. 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 What is that? What do you think that is? You saw you call when he did that case? You call when he Officer King has now advised Chauvin that Floyd does not have a pulse. It is here that we will begin one more count. You're doing okay. You call, you call what you do. You call when you're doing okay, bro. Yes, I am from Minneapolis. Bro, you, 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 you think that's okay? Check his pulse. Check his pulse. Child, check his pulse. Check. The man ain't moved yet, bro. The man ain't moved yet, bro. He's not moving. Bro, you're a bum, bro. You're a bum, bro. You're definitely a bum, bro. About 3.30, EMS at Portland and 36, and they were advised of closer. Oh, he has not moved, no. I've called three. Adalja. Hello, Hello. 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 Hello.
In the top left corner of the Fraser video, you can see that EMS responder Seth Bravender has arrived on scene. Chauvin's knee remains on Floyd's neck. Right now. Nine minutes and 29 seconds. That's the count the prosecution are leading with. But the defense have an argument to make that Chauvin was working within some interpretations of reasonable force guidelines at the time they start the clock. But even if they can convince the jury of that much, they still have these counts to explain. Some viewers may be able to see justification in Chauvin initially taking Floyd down, and perhaps for his actions during some period of time following that, but hopefully it will not be perceived as too presumptuous on our part to assume the vast majority of you are in need of some convincing when it comes to the mid to later parts of that 9 minute 29 second period. The burden of said convincing, of course, falls on the defence and their use of force expert, Barry Broad. So let's see what they've got. What relevance does possible drug influence have in an analysis? Has quite a large impact in my opinion. Floyd's substance use is a part of Chauvin's defense that we'll get more into soon. For now just note that he was found to have the street drugs, methamphetamine and fentanyl in his system. People on the influence of drugs may not be hearing what you're trying to ask them to do. They may not understand. They may have total, they don't feel pain. So techniques you would normally use to, to make somebody comply, they're not feeling. They may have superhuman strength or they may have an ability to go from compliant to extreme non-compliance in a heartbeat. Do you train officers to keep drug-influenced uh, suspects handcuffed? I do. Why? So there's been many instances where handcuffs were removed from a drug-influenced suspect and as soon as they were removed or some type of first aid measure started to be applied, the person is right back to fighting you and you're in a fight for your life. Well, officers are trained that any time you get resistance from a suspect or you're dealing with a high-risk suspect, it's safer for you, the officer, and for the suspect to put him on the ground in a prone position face down. It makes the suspect's mobility diminished. They can't get up and run as quick. It takes away some of the use of their hands so they can't grab you without turning their body, which would give an officer time to react. Um, it limits what they can do with their feet. They can still kick, but they don't have as much mobility or power that they would if they were standing. Does the fact that Mr. Hand, Mr. Floyd was handcuffed somehow um, come into the analysis as to whether or not to put him into a prone position? No, any resistor, handcuffed or not, should go to the ground into a prone control position. Why would it be safer for the suspect to keep him in that prone control? Because if they were to get up and run, handcuffed, trip and fall, sustain facial injuries, other injuries on the ground, their mobility is reduced, their ability to move is reduced, and the ability to hurt themselves is reduced. What if, what if they became sick, for example? Prone control 
instead of having somebody lay on their back where they could aspirate on vomit, prone control, their face is down, airway is clear. If they vomit, it's not gonna go down their trachea or down their throat. I was always trained and feel it's a reasonable assumption that if, if somebody's, I'm choking, I'm choking, when well, you're not choking because you can breathe. If somebody's saying they can't breathe, yet it appears to me they're taking full breaths and they're shouting, to me, the layperson, they can breathe. Is that common, a common misunderstanding within the policing community? I believe it is, yes. Injection, lack of foundation, right? Overall. Lack of foundation is an objection made when counsel contends that a witness's statement is either outside the realm of their expertise or does not have adequate grounding in evidence that has so far been admitted at trial. It can only be speculated as to why Judge Cahill overruled the prosecution on this, but it could be because previous medical expert Dr. Martin Tobin has testified that what Broad has just articulated is indeed a common and dangerous misconception, like we noted before, or Cahill could simply think it's something that Broad is qualified to speak on as a former police training officer. If the officer was justified in using the prone control, and now the suspect is on the ground in a prone control, the maintaining of the prone control to me is not a use of force. Why is it not a use of force? Because it's a control technique. Without It, it doesn't hurt. Um, you've put the suspect in a position where it's safe for you, the officer, safe for them, the suspect, and you're using minimal effort to keep them on the ground. You would agree that the Minneapolis Police Department trains officers to place people in a recovery position, correct? Yes. And you would agree that that was, is based out of concerns of positional, positional asphyxia, agreed? Yes. Now, are there situations where a reasonable police officer would not put a person in the prone position into the recovery position? Yes. Can you describe what those may be? So in this situation, there is space limitations. Mr. Floyd was butted up against the tire of the patrol car. Um, there was traffic still driving down the street. Um, there were crowd issues that took the attention of the officers. Um, Mr. Floyd was still somewhat resisting, so I think those were relatively valid reasons to keep him in the prone. Could you summarize the final opinions that you have made in this case? I felt that Officer Chauvin's interactions with Mr. Floyd were following his training following current practices in policing and were objectively reasonable. Thank you, I have no further questions. Mr. Floyd is face down, handcuffed behind the back, correct? Yes. And uh, at some point, the defendant is on top of him, is that right? I think he had his knee on him. I'm not sure if I would describe that as being on top of him. Uh, if I may uh, publish to the witness Exhibit 17, you see that the uh, defendant has his knee on top of Mr. Floyd. Is that correct? We'll just let Steve Slish's cross-examination run from this point forward, as any interruption would serve to distract from the spectacle of Broad's farcical attempts to barter over things, like what does and does not constitute being on top of a person. But just take note of one thing over the minutes to come. We've already explained how attorneys need to frame their questions within relatively narrow guidelines. They're also not allowed to be overtly hostile to a witness during cross-examination, otherwise known as badgering the witness. That doesn't mean, however, that skilled counsel cannot utilize tools other than words, such as tonality and facial expression, to convey raw contempt to whoever has the misfortune of sitting in front of them. Something Slisher does consistently, and apparently to great effect, as you will soon hear Brod's voice get smaller and smaller as he answers questions. I see his knee in the vicinity of the upper back and neck area. Is it on the top or the bottom of Mr. Floyd? It's on his back, top being top of the head or? You tell me, is it on the top, the bottom, the side? Where is his knee? I see his knee on the upper spine and neck area. Is the upper spine then on the top? Okay, we can, go, we can use top. Okay, you would agree with me then? Yes. Okay. And so the defendant is on top of Mr. Floyd? His knee is on top of his 
And you can't see where his other knee is in this photograph, is that right? That's correct. Are you aware at this point in time that the defendant's right knee is also on top of Mr. Floyd? I believe it was on his arm or to the side of his body. On, on top of him though, right? Yes. Okay. And so I need to ask you if you believe that it is unlikely that orienting yourself on top of a person on the pavement with both legs is unlikely to produce pain? It could. What do you mean it could? Is it unlikely to produce pain or is it likely to produce pain? I'm saying it could produce pain. It could? Yes. Uh, and if it could produce pain then, again, just looking at your premise, if it could produce pain, then it would be a use of force, wouldn't it? If the officer's intent was to inflict pain, that Not would be use of force? Not the officer's intent, sir. What you said is that it was unlikely to produce pain, and that's why it wasn't a use of force. You now just said that it could produce pain. And so, regardless of the officer's intent, if this act that we're looking at here in Exhibit 17 could produce pain, would you agree that what we're seeing here is a use of force? Shown in this picture, that could be a use of force. Okay. Do you agree with the proposition that in law enforcement, once somebody is in your custody, they're in your care? I agree. And situational awareness then, would you agree, sir, that includes being aware of the subject's medical condition? Yes. Particularly if they're exhibiting signs of distress. Yes. Uh-huh. 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 Ah, there's water or something. Please. Please. Ah -ha. You were able to hear that? Yes. All right. And you heard Mr. Floyd saying that he couldn't breathe, correct? Yes. You heard Mr. Floyd saying that his stomach hurt, is that right? I wasn't listening for that. I heard him ask for water, I think. You heard him ask for water. Yes. Would you believe me if I told you that what Mr. Floyd said was my stomach hurts, my neck hurts, everything hurts? I heard everything hurts, yes. Okay. And, and that would be uh, you know, some sort of expression of pain, fair? You could. In, in your own analysis, before coming to court today, had you identified that voice that said, uh-huh, in response to Mr. Floyd's cries for pain, is that belonging to the defendant? Yes, I had. Okay. And so you would acknowledge that Mr. Floyd was crying out in pain and the defendant was at least acknowledging that he could hear him at the time. If that's what the aha uh -huh was in response to. Okay. Well, was the aha uh -huh in the reasonable context in which this conversation, if you can call it that, took place in response and immediately after Mr. Floyd's individual cries for, for uh, pleas for pain or uh, claims of pain. It was the same time frame. Yeah. And so my stomach hurts, uh-huh. My neck hurts, uh-huh. Everything hurts, right? That's yes. what you heard. And the uh-huh was the defendant responding. Yes. Up to this point and beyond this point, the defendant did not alter the level of force that he was using on Mr. Floyd, did he? No. Even though Mr. Floyd by this point had become, as you put, compliant. Fair? More compliant, yes. Well, what part of this is not compliant? So I see his arm position in the picture that's posted. Right. That, you know, a compliant person would have both their hands in the small of their back and just be resting comfortably versus like he's still moving around. Did you say resting comfortably? or laying comfortably resting comfortably on the pavement yes at this point in time when he's attempting to breathe by shoving his shoulder into the pavement i was describing what the signs of a perfectly compliant person would be so attempting to breathe while restrained is a being slightly non-compliant no no you fucking stopping he's breathing right now, bro. You think that's cool? You think that? Okay. During that time period, and uh, I don't know if you heard, did you hear another officer? Did you hear the voice of Officer Lane say he's passing out? I didn't hear that, no. Did you hear Mr. Lane say that at any point in your analysis 
of these videos before you came to court today? About what Mr. Late or Officer Late said? That's correct. Yes. He's not resisting. He's not talking. It's not possible, is it? To do what? Resist. I think it's definitely possible to resist. When you just... passed out. He's not doing it here, is he? Not when he's passed out, no. When we talk about what's possible, let's talk about what's, what's happening in this case. He's not resisting, is he? And this snippet, no. Right. Did you hear uh, at some point in your review, Officer King say that he couldn't find a pulse? Yes. Right. All of this would have been known to a reasonable officer in the defendant's position, correct? Yes. And the defendant's position is and was and remains, as we see here at this moment, in this time, in this clip, on top of Mr. Floyd, on the street. Isn't that right? Yes. I have nothing further. At this point, it's fair to say the defence remains somewhat on the back foot. Although juries can be unpredictable, and the defence only need to win over one stubborn member to get a mistrial, which would be a huge win for them at this point, it's very difficult to see how any reasonable person could interpret Chauvin's actions as, quote, force that is authorised by law. They do have one more out, though, and that is whether they can cast doubt on Derek Chauvin's actions being a, quote, substantial causal factor in Floyd's death. The phrase substantial causal factor really highlights how much work they have cut out for them. The only thing they have to be grateful for is that they don't have to argue that Chauvin's kneeling on Floyd had absolutely nothing to do with his death. But on the flip side of that, it's also not enough for them to simply make the case that other factors may have contributed they need to make the case that those factors were so significant that the pressure applied to Floyd's body may well have had a negligible contribution to his passing. We'll start by giving a summary of the defence argument, and then take a look at how each element plays out at trial. Floyd had pre-existing heart conditions. He also physically exerted himself in the process of resisting arrest. That, combined with the drugs in his system, put his heart under an unmanageable amount of strain, causing him to suffer a fatal heart attack while being subdued prone on the ground. Even more significance should be put on aforementioned factors, when some experts argue being prone with weight applied to your back is not inherently dangerous. We'll address the heart conditions with a brief explainer, as the relevant medical testimony is a little too technical to follow easily in small chunks. George Floyd had an enlarged heart, 540 grams. Some studies have found 510 grams to be at the higher end of what you would expect the heart of a man of Floyd's size to weigh. This means his heart would have demanded a correspondingly larger supply of oxygenated blood than the average person. He also had a narrowing of all of his coronary arteries, which would have resulted in a reduction of blood supply to his heart. The long and short of it is he would have been very susceptible to a heart attack, especially if under severe physical strain. On the drugs we'll let witness testimony do most of the heavy lifting, but one thing to note before we get into that is there was a lot of quibbling during the trial over exactly when Floyd may have ingested substances and how seriously those substances should be taken given the levels they were at in his body. The short version is this. It is an undisputed fact fentanyl and methamphetamine were in his system. The prosecution argue, however, that given Floyd had a drug problem and would have therefore built up a tolerance, it's a fanciful notion they would have played a significant role in his demise, especially given the levels of both drugs were notably low, lower than about a quarter of DUI cases examined in one study regarding the fentanyl, lower than 90% of DUIs regarding the meth, the defence object that this is unreasonably dismissive, given that any medical professional would agree no level of these street drugs is safe, and their presence in a person's body would have nothing but cardiological downsides, downsides that would be compounded of course by the pre-existing conditions we've been over. The key medical witness for the defence is Dr David Fowler, former chief medical examiner for the state of Maryland. He'll be unpacking the defence case for the significance of the drugs, as well as their arguments on restraint in the prone position. How does long-term drug use affect narrowing of the arteries? Well, in this particular case, methamphetamine, which was present in Mr. Floyd, has been associated with earlier onset of narrowing of the coronary arteries by atherosclerosis. So methamphetamine is dangerous at, at several levels in this particular case. One, it has known arrhythmogenic potential. In other words, it sensitizes the heart to arrhythmias. Secondly, it increases the rate that the heart beats at. As a stimulant, 
it pushes the heart beat rate up. So therefore the heart is now going to demand increased oxygen, the heart muscle itself. And thirdly, it is a vasoconstrictor. So a vasoconstrictor is a substance which causes blood vessels, usually in arteries, to narrow. And it's physiologically important, and it is protective in certain circumstances, but can become dangerous in others. And the way a vasoconstrictor works in most circumstances is to act on the muscular layer that's present in arteries. And it causes that muscular layer to begin to contract. A little bit of contraction, that's good. Too much contraction, and it can slow down the blood beyond what is necessary. And even in certain circumstances, you can stop the blood by giving a vasoconstrictor substance. How would you characterize the role of fentanyl from the standpoint of forensic pathology? Not toxicology, forensic pathology. So fentanyl is a powerful narcotic. It's about 80 times more powerful than morphine. And the side effects of fentanyl are slowing down the respiration. So that impairs your ability to breathe as fast as you normally would. So in this case, can you just kind of describe the layers of factors that lead you to your conclusion that this was a sudden cardiac event? So we have a heart that's vulnerable because it's too big. It demands lots of oxygen. It has very narrow vessels. There are certain drugs that are present in his system that make it put it at risk of an arrhythmia, the methamphetamine. There is another drug, fentanyl, which slows down your breathing, which will lower the oxygen, potentially, saturation in your, in your blood. Multiple entities all acting together and adding to each other and taking away from a different part of the, of the ability to get oxygen into his heart. And so at some point, the heart ex exhausted its reserves of um, metabolic supply and went into an arrhythmia and then stopped pumping blood effectively. If a person were to lay down on the street in the prone position with nothing on top of them, is that in and of itself inherently dangerous? No, the scientific studies basically have looked at the issue of the prone position with and without weight and made a determination that there really is no significant impairment of the individual's respiratory function. Uh, what's the kind of the leading study on weight applied to someone in the prone position? I think there, there are several, but the one that um, I've recently read, well not recently, but I know of, is, is the one by uh, Dr. Mark Kroll. In terms of this study, can you just explain this study? Um, can you explain the setting of the study, etc.? So this is a review paper where he refers to various papers, including his own work, um, where no evidence of any kind of compressional asphyxia was found in individuals who were in the so-called hog tie situation, which is prone, with their hands handcuffed behind their backs, additional restraints applied around the ankles and then the two tied together. And then weights were applied to the individual up to 102 kilograms, which is 225 pounds, and found, again, no significant um, disturbance at, to their ability to exchange and breathe. In this paper, Dr. Kroll says, positional asphyxia, as the term is used in court today, is an interesting hypothesis unsupported by any experimental data. So basically, his conclusion was, it doesn't matter how much the officer weighs. Yeah. 140, 150, 100, or 200 pounds. Doesn't really make a huge difference to the outcome. Um, what he did say is that with a double knee restraint, specifically, it's two knees on the person, it has a modest influence on the weight applied to. Now, these are not testing respiration. These were weight tests on dummies. So what he's measuring here is if a person weighs 140 pounds and they kneel on somebody, how much weight are they transferring? 
With a single knee, it didn't matter what weight the individual was. With a double knee, up to 23% of their body weight could be transferred to the dummy. Um, do you know, based on your review of the materials, were you able to ascertain uh, Officer Chauvin's weight? I was informed, yes, and I've seen that weight. And what is that? 140 pounds is what I was told. What portion of Mr. Chauvin's weight was transferred onto Mr. Floyd's body? He's using a single knee technique through the greater majority. His other knee is either on the bicep area or on close to the left chest wall. So single knee tech, it's going to be less than 23%. But even if he applied both knees, he, he, would, have, he would have transferred 23% of his body weight. For a 140 pound person, that would be between 30 and 35 pounds. Um, less than 225 pounds from the yes. laboratory experiment. Yes. Is it your opinion that Mr. Chauvin's knee in any way impacted the structures of Mr. Floyd's neck? No, it did not. None of the vital structures um, were in the area where the knee appeared to be from the videos. You've reviewed photographs, you've reviewed the autopsy photographs, things of that nature, correct? Yes. And what injuries did you observe in the photographs of Mr. Floyd? All of his injuries were in areas where the knee was not. In other words, they were on the front of his body, um, his face, his places where he was restrained, but there was absolutely no evidence of any in injury on the skin to the subcutaneous tissue or the deeper structures of the back or the neck. And so in your opinion, the absence of such injury, how does that speak to the cause of death? It speaks to the amount of force that was applied to Mr. Floyd was less than enough to bruise him. In your career as a forensic pathologist, have you uh, looked at other strangulation type cases? I've, yes, strangulation and other restraint situations where knees have been used, yes. Do you typically see marks in those cases? In manual strangulation, often you will see hemorrhaging into the muscles of the neck. Um, and in cases where the knee has been used on the back, we often see a bruise consistent and in times we have matched it to video cam footage of where we see a knee being placed, yes. The pressure from somebody's fingers is enough to cause muscle hemorrhage in a manual strangulation case. We're not talking about a person putting weight on somebody, we're just talking about somebody squeezing a neck. Uh, do you agree that as an expert witness, you should be objective, fair, and impartial as best you can. Yes, I would agree that that's appropriate as best you can. Uh, do you agree that in the background research you do to testify, that you should be thorough? Yes. And meaning you should do your homework before you arrive at your opinion. Fair enough? Yes. Again, a note on the rules of cross-examination and how skilled attorneys can circumvent objections on the grounds of badgering a witness. Whereas Thisha demonstrated how one can rattle a witness and more importantly convey a sense of mistrust to the jury without the use of words, Jerry Blackwell is now showing us how to achieve a similar effect with the questions themselves while still not breaking any rules. In theory, there is absolutely nothing hostile about asking an expert witness if they think it's important to do their homework and be objective and impartial. In context, however, Blackwell may as well be calling Dr. Fowler an asshole. I asked that question in part because uh, you asked a question about Mr. Chauvin's weight, and, and you understand that the relevance of Mr. Chauvin's weight to this case is how much weight he was putting onto the body of George Floyd beneath him. You understand that, don't you? Yes. You told the jury that Mr. Chauvin's weight was 140 pounds, didn't you? That's the information that I was provided, yes. Where did you get this information provided? From counsel. Uh, did, uh, in the information that uh, was provided to you, uh, were you not told that Mr. Chauvin was wearing equipment? That was not considered as part of the process. I agree with you, Counselor. All right, so 
You know he is wearing equipment, though. He's a police officer at the time, right? Absolutely. And so you didn't factor in the weight of his equipment that was also on the body of Mr. Floyd. Is that true? That is true. Uh, now, you agree that uh, as an expert witness, you shouldn't jump to conclusions. That is, you should reach fair conclusions based upon a careful, considered analysis. That is correct, yes. Uh, do you agree that you shouldn't come at this in a way that's biased? You agree with that, don't you? Absolutely agree with that, yes. You shouldn't cherry pick facts. No. You shouldn't try to confuse the jury. Correct. The severe negligence and research on Dr. Fowler's part that Blackwell is insinuating is at least a little unfair. The defense will point out on redirect that the state themselves never provided an actual or estimated weight of Chauvin's equipment. So even if it is extremely important, both sides are responsible for this gross oversight. Also bear in mind that Fowler's position, whatever you might think of it, is that a weight of up to 225 pounds applied to someone's bag, while in the prone position, should not pose a serious threat of asphyxia, and that the amount of weight Chauvin was transferring from his body would have been 30 to 35 pounds. So even if the gun belt weighed as much as Chauvin himself, and all of its weight was being transferred, it still wouldn't come close to the 225 pound mark. This isn't to say that all or even most of Blackwell's critiques are slights of hand, however. Doctor, there are, are two component methods of ventilating uh, the lungs. One is to move uh, your ribs and the other is to be able to move your diaphragm. Is that true? That is true, yes. But the, the key thing uh, for breathing is that you be able to uh, expand your chest. If you can't expand your chest, you can't breathe. Correct. You need to expand the capacity of the chest cavity so that the lungs draw air in as part of the, the process. You know, I'd like to focus with you for a moment on the first <clears throat> uh, roughly five minutes uh, that uh, Mr. Floyd was under, on the ground uh, as part of the subdual and the restraint under uh, Mr. Chavez. Um, did you analyze where Mr. Chauvin's knees were uh, relative to the positioning of Mr. Floyd's body in that first five minutes? I did review the positioning, yes. Would you agree with me that for over half of that time period, Mr. Chauvin's left knee was on the neck and his uh, right knee is at times on the back and at other times on his left arm or pushed in against his left side? That is correct. Those are all the positions that I observed the knee in, um, the right knee, um, during that period of time. And so <clears throat> Mr. Floyd then is uh, sandwiched, in a way, uh, between Mr. Chauvin on top and the asphalt pavement beneath it, right? Yes, if you... It's a yes or no question. Yes. Um, I want to ask you a, a question about putting pressure uh, on someone's neck. That is, if you're on uh, a person's back and you are applying pressure to the neck. Uh, doctor, do you agree uh, that if pressure is applied to somebody's neck in the prone position, and the person is squeezed until they become responsive. And if that pressure is maintained for a minimum of four minutes, that can cause irreversible brain damage because the brain may be starved of oxygen. Is that true? Once cessation of oxygen to the brain starts. Dr. Fowler, my question was, is it true? Would you please restate, restate the question? Yes, sir. If you apply pressure to someone's neck and squeeze until the person becomes unresponsive and you maintain that pressure for at least four minutes, you will cause irreversible brain damage because you will have starved the brain of oxygen. Is that true? Correct. It takes four minutes of no supply of oxygen to the brain to cause irreversible brain damage. Now, if, if somebody dies as a result of the consequences of insufficient oxygen or low oxygen, uh, 
we know that when that person dies, they're going to die of cardiopulmonary arrest because everybody dies of cardiopulmonary arrest. Fair enough? Yes. And if a person dies as a result of low oxygen, uh, that person's also going to die ultimately of a fatal arrhythmia, right? Correct. Every one of us in this room will have a fatal arrhythmia at some point. Right, because that's kind of how you go. Yes. Uh, Dr. Fowler, are you familiar <clears throat> with a text known as Spitz and Fisher? Yes. Pretty big. <laughs> uh, this is a standard text for medical examiners, uh, isn't it? It's certainly one of the recommended um, books that fellows in forensic pathology will review as part of their training, yes. And it's one you've uh, in the past referred to as a reliable text. Yes. Uh, it contains uh, sections on death by asphyxia, doesn't it? Yes. Do you agree, Dr. Fowler, that uh, the majority of cases where somebody dies of asphyxia are very subtle and in fact no traumatic manifestations are visible at all? In a substantial number of the cases, I'm not sure it's absolutely the majority. Uh, Dr. Fowler, can you see here from uh, represent, this is from Spitz and Fisher, uh, for identification purposes, uh, Your Honor's Exhibit A14 for the record. Am I reading here correctly that, however, the majority of cases are subtle, in fact, often with no traumatic manifestations at all? I read that accurately. Yes, you did. If you were listening very closely to that exchange, you might have noticed that Dr. Fowler technically won it, even though it didn't sound like it. When Blackwell first quoted Spitz and Fisher on asphyxia deaths, he read it aloud as, the majority of cases where somebody dies of asphyxia are very subtle and in fact no traumatic manifestations are visible at all. And Fowler's contention was In a substantial number of the cases I'm not sure it's absolutely the majority. Then when Blackwell confidently produced the actual text, put it in front of Fowler and read it absolutely verbatim, as he now had to, the wording was ever so slightly different. Am I reading here correctly that, however, the majority of cases are subtle, in fact, often with no traumatic manifestations at all? I read that accurately. Yes, you did. The very before subtle disappeared. But more importantly, the word often suddenly makes an appearance. So not an outright majority, just like Fowler said. The substance of the point Blackwell is making is still completely valid, of course. That Floyd having no abrasions on the areas where pressure was applied is not significantly outside the norm of what you would see in asphyxia deaths. Still, the exchange is a great example of how you can sometimes appear to be walking all over a person, even while actively demonstrating that you are the one in error, so long as you maintain the composure of being the validated party. Is it true, Dr. Fowler, that none of the, of the prone restraint studies that you referred to actually studied uh, subjects who had someone's knee on their neck in the prone position. Is that true? That is true. Uh, none of the studies uh, went for as long as 9 minutes and 29 seconds. Is that true? That is true. From the, from the time he's first put on the ground, that he's pulled out of the car, squat 320, He's subdued and restrained on the ground. Mr. Chauvin is on his uh, neck and back. Um, did you ever see uh, Mr. Floyd at any time uh, manifest either sleepiness, a lack of awareness, that he wasn't arousable, or that sort of thing? No, not until he lost consciousness. And, and typically, doctor, when somebody uh, passes away from a fentanyl or opioid overdose, one of the hallmarks of that is that they are uh, very sleepy and they will tend to be unarousable and uh, pass away in essentially a coma, right? Correct. If they are passing away from fentanyl overdose, that's what happens. Would you agree with me then that as the EELV goes down, uh, do you agree that as that goes down, it takes more work to breathe? That is my understanding, but I'm not a pulmonary um, physician. All right, so fair enough. For that, you would defer to a pulmonary physician. For more detail, yes. And as it so happens, the prosecution star expert witness is such a pulmonary physician. 
Dr. Martin Tobin's testimony has already been referenced a couple of times in this video, and it best encapsulates the prosecution's explanation of what was and was not responsible for George Floyd's death. One juror has even stated publicly that it was his testimony that knocked them off the fence. If you're in two minds about the substantial causal factor question as things stand, see if it has the same effect on you. Have you formed an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty on the cause of Mr. Floyd's death? Yes, I have. Uh, would you please tell the jury what that opinion or opinions are? Yes, yes uh, Mr. Floyd died from a low level of oxygen, and this caused damage to his brain that we see, and it also caused uh, a PEA arrhythmia that caused his heart to stop. Have you formed an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to what the cause is uh, or was for the low level of oxygen in Mr. Floyd? Yes, I have. Would you tell us what that is? The cause of the low level of oxygen was shallow breathing. The main forces that are going to lead to the shallow breath are going to be that he's turned prone on the street, that he has the handcuffs in place combined with the street, and then that he has a knee on his neck, and then that he has a knee on his back and on his side. Now you can see the car is being rotated. You're able to see uh, Officer Chauvin. You're able to see Officer King and then Officer Lane down at his feet. You see underneath Mr. Floyd and now the car has been rotated. Now the car has been removed. And so you're able to see how they're positioned at different points uh, in terms of with Officer Chauvin with his left knee on the neck his right knee on uh, Mr. Floyd's arm and chest, and then you can see here Officer Lane holding his legs, and then you can see Officer King with his knee uh, on his torso. Officer Chauvin's left knee is virtually on the neck for the vast majority of the time. What is the effect of the handcuffs in the context of what happened to Mr. Floyd? The handcuffs are extremely important in Mr. Floyd. Then how he's manipulated with the handcuffs by both Officer Chauvin and by Officer King, how they manipulate the handcuffs. And they're pushing the handcuffs into his back and pushing them high. Then on the other side, you have the street. So the street is playing a crucial part because he's against a hard asphalt street. So the way they're pushing down on his handcuffs combined with the street, his left side, and it's particularly the left side we see that, it's like the left side is in a vice. It's totally being pushed in, squeezed in from each side, from the street at the bottom, and then from the, uh, the way that the handcuffs are manipulated. It's not just the handcuffs. It's how the handcuffs are being held, how they're being pushed, where they're being pushed, that uh, totally interfere with central features of how we breathe. If you look on the left side, you see his finger is pushing against his street. You also see the hands here of the officers around his left hand. You can see the left handcuffed arm, how it's been really rammed into the back of his back. There's just no way he's going to be able to expand that. Then over on the right image, you see his knuckle against the tire. And to most people, this doesn't look terribly significant. But to a physiologist, this is extraordinarily significant. Because this tells you that he has used up his resources and he is now literally trying to breathe with his fingers and knuckles because when you begin to breathe, you begin to breathe with your rib cage and your diaphragm. The next thing you recruit after that is your sternomastoid muscle, which is the big muscle in your neck. And then when those are wasted up, then you're re relying on these types of muscles like your fingers to try and stabilize your whole right side, because he's totally dependent on getting air into the right side. So he's using his fingers and his knuckles against the street to try and crank up the right side of his chest. This is his only way to try and get air to get into the right lung. 
I mean, when you have to breathe through a narrow passageway, it's like uh, breathing through a drinking straw. But it's much worse than that, because breathing through a drinking straw, I mean, is somewhat unpleasant, but not that unpleasant. And then it gets much worse than that. So if you focus down here on where he is, the handcuff is and where his arm is close to his black shirt is the best place to see. And you can count out his respiratory rate. So you're seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, once you have 19 seconds and you count out the number of breaths you have here, you count out seven breaths, that will come out at a respiratory rate of 22. Is that number, um, the respiratory rate of 22, significant to this case? It's extremely significant. Why is that? Because one of the things in this case is the question of fentanyl. And if fentanyl is having an effect and is causing depression of the respiratory centers, the centers that control breathing, that's going to result in a decrease in the respiratory rate. And it's shown that with fentanyl, you expect a 40% reduction in the respiratory rate. So with fentanyl, his respiratory rate should be down at around 10. Instead of that, it's right in the middle of normal at 22. There's two other things that are very important to the respiratory rate, because you saw it with your own eyes exactly his respiratory rate. And the first thing is that if you have somebody who has underlying heart disease, and the heart disease is so severe that it's been said that it's causing shortness of breath, that it's causing you difficulty with breathing. If somebody has heart disease that's causing shortness of breath, virtually all of those patients are going to have very high respiratory rates they're going to have respiratory rates of 35, 30, over 30, even over 40. When you have heart disease, that'll give you shortness of breath. Instead of that, we find that his respiratory rate is normal at 22. I found it very interesting uh, in your testimony and your report when you're kind of talking about this notion of if you can't speak or if you can speak, it doesn't mean you can, or, sorry, I have to say, it. if you can speak, you can breathe, yeah. right? Um, and you describe this as a very dangerous proposition, right? Yes. yes. You describe this as causing a false sense of security to people, right? That's how Correct. you Correct. Yeah. Right. And in fact, in your report, you actually uh, write a paragraph about how physicians oftentimes uh, have trouble with this, right? Yes. You wrote in your report that some doctors incorrectly consider patients hysterical and the symptoms yes imaginary in nature, which further aggregates patient distress, right? Yes, yes, I recall. Someone comes in and they're yeah. hyperventilating and they articulate to their physician, yes. I can't breathe, yes. right? And it's hyperventilation syndrome, right? Yes. And physicians oftentimes, as you indicate, yes. confuse this issue. Correct. They blame the patient, right? Or I don't have to blame the patient, but I mean, they, they certainly missed the diagnosis. Not to make a mountain out of a molehill, but you can even see Nelson realize he's making an overstatement as he sits up his premise that even trained physicians are prone to making the talking breathing mistake. They blame the patient, right? Or I don't have to blame the patient, but I mean, they, they certainly missed the diagnosis. It's not that it's a big deal in and of itself, but when a witness's testimony has been absolutely devastating for your client, it is of the utmost importance that you do as much damage control as humanly possible on cross. The smallest of stumbles become that much more significant when they blunt the force of the points you need to land with as much impact as you can muster. And unfortunately for Derek Chauvin, that is the theme that colours the entirety of Eric Nelson's cross of Dr. Martin Tobin. While he delivered a very competent performance, including many good cross-examinations over the course of the trial, for whatever reason, when it came to this witness, Nelson began losing his voice and command of the English language right when he needed them most. The Minneapolis police lieutenant who trains Minneapolis police officers testified that it is frequently said and trained to police officers that a person can talk, it means they can breathe. 
you would have a problem with that. You would, yes, I mean, they're able to breathe at that moment in time, but 10 seconds later, they may be dead. Right. And because <clears throat> dealing with any person is a rapidly evolving situation that can change from second to second. Yes. What we have learned about Mr. Floyd from his autopsy and his medical records is that we understand that Mr. Floyd had some heart disease, right? That is correct. In fact, I believe uh, that he had uh, in some of his arteries somewhere between a 75 and 90 percent occlusion of his ventricular arteries, right? Correct. And that's going to affect blood flow in a, in a person, right? It's going to make the body work a little harder to get the blood through the body. No, no, not really. It's not going to do that. Nelson is not a medical professional, so it's hard to fault him for small misunderstandings like this. But again, they make a big difference. Even if he can get Dr. Tobin to agree with a premise that helps him bolster the case for Floyd's pre-existing heart conditions playing a significant role in his death, it just won't sound as compelling if he has to spend extra time getting his head around the mechanics of the human body before arriving at the destination he's aiming for. Okay, how does that affect a person's respiratory? The, the coronary artery? Mm -hmm. If the coronary artery is affecting it, and if the coronary artery was contributing to shortness of breath, you would expect that he would be complaining of chest pain, and you would be expect that he would be demonstrating a very rapid respiratory rate. We don't see either. Okay. Um, and we'll come back to the res re res <laughs> respiration. Res I can't say it. I'm, I'm taken by your accent. Uh, uh, the respi respiratory I can't, rate. I can't compensate for it. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, as I'll say it like you, his respiratory rate. Okay. There you go. All right. When a person is ingesting illicit street purchased fentanyl, it's it's a, every time they take a fentanyl dose, it's a different experience for that person. Right, but it, if, if it's affecting the respiratory center, it's going to act through the mu receptors in the medulla oblongata. There's no way around that. Right. It's not, fentanyl isn't going to have an effect on respiration by some other mechanism. Understood. But the end result of fentanyl can include resp respiratory depression. Right, through the mu receptors. Right. And we also learned that there was methamphetamine in a low dose in Mr. Uh, Floyd's system, right? Correct. And the fentanyl and the methamphetamine, they can kind of counteract each other, right? Well, I mean, they're upward and downwards, but I mean, but in terms of the respiratory centers, there's not going to be. So the methamphetamine would not, it, I mean, the methamphetamine is going to increase the heart rate, right? That's a different thing than the respiratory centers. Understood, yeah. but that's going to, methamphetamine will increase a person's heart rate, right? Yes. That's one of the side effects. Yes. If partially ingested pills that were determined to c contain uh, both fentanyl and methamphetamine were found partially ingested in the back seat of, a squad, of the squad car and that those pet pills had been <clears throat> had come had the DNA of the, in, of the deceased individual on them meaning that they took them Mm -hmm. And those pills would have been in his mouth at about 218 or 2018, right? Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that you would expect the peak fentanyl respiratory depression within about five minutes? If there was any amount of it ingested, yes, the peak would be five minutes. Right. And so if it happened at 2018 or thereabouts when the individual was in the back of the car mm -hmm. you would expect that peak respiratory depression to be around 2013 right 20, 20, 2023 i'm sorry 2018 to 2023 is you're five. trying to really confuse me mr nelson <laughs> i'm sorry i think i can actually say it's been a long week now uh, so 2018 is the ingestion point. You would expect peak respiratory depression by 2023. Correct. Right? That's the peak, meaning that it could continue afterwards, right? Right. All right. And there, of course, was another example. 
getting Dr. Tobin to essentially confirm that the peak effects of the fentanyl and methamphetamine Floyd seemed to have ingested in the squad car would have set in at about five minutes from that point, which was around where Floyd seemed to be losing consciousness, was the only real win Nelson got during cross. Not a game changer, but something, and again whatever effect it could have had was diluted by a badly timed mental lapse. Eliciting laughter from a jury can be a good thing, but never when they're supposed to be considering the most substantive point you've made all day. After all witnesses have been put on the stand and the defense is just about to rest their case, they have one last crucial decision to make. Mr. Chauvin, uh, you and I have had several discussions throughout the course of my representation of you relevant to your right to testify or to choose to remain silent, correct? That's correct. And during the course of our representation, it's fair to say uh, that you and I have had this conversation multiple times, correct? Correct. Uh, you understand that you have a Fifth Amendment privilege to remain silent? Do you understand that? Yes. Do you understand that if you choose to exercise that right to remain silent, neither the state nor the court can comment on your silence as a sign or an indication of your guilt? Meaning they can't say, he didn't get up and defend himself, so equate your silence with guilt. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. Now, you also understand that you can waive that right and testify. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. You understand that if you chose not to testify, or if you did in fact testify, you would be subject to cross-examination by the state of Minnesota? Yes. You understand that if you uh, were cross-examined by the state, we could not attempt to limit the scope of your testimony. The state would be given broad latitude to ask you questions. Do you understand that? Yes. We've had this conversation repeatedly, correct? Correct. I have repeatedly advised you that this is your decision and your decision alone, right? Correct. Um, I have advised you uh, and we have gone back and forth on the matter would be kind of an understatement, right? Yes, it is. Um, but after a lengthy meeting um, last night, we had some further discussion, agreed? Correct. The decision of whether or not to take the stand as a defendant can often be an excruciating one, and many defense attorneys are very reluctant to advise it for reasons Eric Nelson has just laid out. If you want to see an intimate illustration of this dilemma, a good documentary miniseries to watch is The Staircase, which gives a behind-the-scenes look at novelist Michael Peterson's defense against the charge of brutally murdering his wife Kathleen in their North Carolina home. Peterson's attorney, David Rudolph, does ultimately decide there is a net gain to be had in his client choosing to testify, but the lengths to which his defense team goes to coach him in the lead-up to the big day is astounding, and just serves to further emphasize what a high-stakes decision it is. For what it's worth, he was convicted, but it can't be said whether or not his testimony was the deciding factor in that. To put it simply, there are two main reasons to recommend your client waive their Fifth Amendment right when they have absolutely nothing to lose, or when you think there is a serious chance that they will be eloquent and personable enough on the stand to minimize whatever damage might be done when facing cross-examination. And um, have you made a decision uh, today whether you intend to testify or whether you intend to invoke your Fifth Amendment privilege? Uh, I will invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege today. Evidently, the defense came to the conclusion that Derek Chauvin was not secretly the most charming man in the world, and or that he still had a fighting chance of an acquittal on at least the most severe charge of second-degree murder. They were wrong on at least one of those counts. We the jury in the above entitled matter as to count one, unintentional second-degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April 2021 at 1.44 p.m. This is the face of a man, whose inner thoughts are honestly very hard to discern. Same caption, verdict count two. We the jury in the above entitled matter as to count two, third degree murder, perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. This verdict... But one can't help but think that he might now be wondering, and probably not for the first time, how his life might be different if he were just a little less stubborn once in a while. Three. 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 Three